15. Uh, here we find a very, very familiar passage of Scripture. And uh, there's, I'm sure there's not a person in here that, that doesn't, if you don't know uh, the passage or if you couldn't tell somebody where the story was found in the Bible, I'm sure everybody here uh, knows the story of the prodigal son. And uh, in this story, the younger brother uh, receives most of the press in the retelling of this story, and that bad press, most of it. And uh, he was a bad boy. He did some bad things. But the elder brother, uh, whom I want to preach about tonight, really is the real culprit in this story. He's the real object lesson in this story. The Lord was attempting to use this, and it's just a parable. That's all it was, a parable. But undoubtedly, in the Lord's day, it had its practical uh, outplay in the lives of the homes and families in and around Jerusalem, just as it does in our day and time. There's not anybody sitting in this building that doesn't know somebody that is either a prodigal or some uh, poor man or woman who has experienced a prodigal a son or daughter in their, in their home. And so it's a, it's a very practical sort of a story. It's just a story, but it is obviously... Uh, a very practical uh, application and obviously a very real situation in many lives in that day and time and also in our own. Some of you here maybe can even identify uh, with this younger brother. And he did have a problem. I submit to you, though, that the elder brother had a problem much more serious than the younger brother. Now, the younger brother's problem was quite obvious. Uh, if no other reason... The elder brother's problem was more serious because it wasn't as obvious. You see, if you're in the hog pen, everybody knows it. You smell like a hog, friend. You stink. You can tell it from afar off. Uh, that's just, it's just obvious. But this elder brother had the kind of a problem that he could sit in and amongst clean folk, sanctified folk, sit at the uh, dinner parties and sit with the upper crust, as it were. Nobody would ever even begin to anticipate that he had a problem, but he did. Let's read, if you would, in verse number 11. It said, And a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And you know the story how that not many days after the younger son took everything he had, went off to a far country, the Bible said, and there wasted his substance on riotous living. Then wasn't long after a while when the money ran out and the friends ran out and he got a good old-fashioned dose of reality, he came to his senses and he said, I'm going to go home. I'm going to face my father and I'm going to admit that I've sinned and that I've sinned against God and I've sinned against him and I'm no more fit. I'm not worthy to be called his son. And so he got up and he went home and that's exactly what he did. And to his father, notice his father did not interrupt him in the little story. He said, Father, he said, I've sinned. His dad didn't say, shut your mouth, son. We don't... No, he let him have his say. He needed to admit that he sinned. And he needed to admit that I'm no more worthy to be called. He, he needed to admit all that. But he's going to say, now make me as one of thy hired servants. Well, no, we're not going to get to that stage. Yeah, you're, you, you have sinned, but you are my son. You may not be worthy of it, but you are my son. We're not going to have this hired servant business. You are my son. And so then he takes him back in. They're having a big party. They've thrown a big party. Notice we'll pick up the narrative in verse 25. It says, Now his elder son was in the field, and then he came and drew nigh to the house. He heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things mean, meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry, and would not go in. Therefore came his father out, and entreated him. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. And yet thou never gavest me a kid, that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. He said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead, and is alive again, and was lost, and is found. Our Father, thank you so much for your mercy and your grace. And God, it's been sung about and preached about uh, all these many days of this meeting. And I thank you for it. I revel in the grace of God. And I thank you for the eternal life. And that's in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
And I thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being here this week and uh, having heard these sermons and these songs and fellowshipping with God's people. And I pray, Lord, that all that's been said afore would have uh, found a lodging place in the hearts of your people. I hope many, even at this time, are chewing on it and thinking about it. And some maybe that uh, should have made some move and did not. I pray before this service is over, they'll do that. Now, Father, bless, I pray, exalt Jesus above every name that's named. And, Lord, bless, expose the devil for what he is. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. He's worthy. Amen and amen. As I said, I want to talk to you about the elder brother. The elder brother is, is obviously who he should have been, and uh, he's where he should have been, but the problem is he's not what he should have been. And uh, he, you, you know, there's a, there's a lot of things that you can still be and not, and not be right with the Father. Listen, my friend, you, it takes more. Uh, you can have the right Bible, and you can cut your hair right, and wear your clothes right, and dress right, and smell right, and all. And I'm all for all those things, but you can get all that and still not be right with the Father. Listen, this fella, he was a son, tells us in verse number 10, said, uh, or verse number 11, a certain man had two sons. This elder brother was a son of the Father, but he wasn't right with his father. Uh, he was a son. He also was involved in service. You can have service and not be right with the Father. Look down there in verse 25. Now his elder son was in the field. He was in service. He was a son, but he wasn't right with the Father. And you can even have success in that service and not be right with the Father. Look in verse 27. He said, what's going on here? And he said, well, he said, thy brother is coming, thy father hath killed the fatted calf. Now, where do you suppose they got the fatted calf from? I submit to you while this younger brother was out there wasting his substance and his inheritance with riotous living, somebody, thank God, was back on the farm taking care of the fields and the animals and fattening up a calf. Thank God when they needed one, they could come and get one because somebody had tended to that business. Listen, you can be a son, or you can be a child of the Father, you can be involved in the service of the Father up to your eyeballs, you can even parade out your success to that service. You can pray the souls of one to Christ. You can pray it all out for all to see and still not be right with the Father. This, this boy wasn't right with his father. But he was a son. He was involved in service. He was out in the field. He wasn't out in the hog pen. And he had success to show for his service, but he wasn't right with the Father. And then not only that, he not only had the service and success and sonship, but he had seniority. Look at that in verse number 29. He answered and said to his father, Lo, lo, these many years... Do I serve thee? I submit to you, this boy is not a novice. He didn't start out on this escapade two years ago, amen. He's got seniority. Lo, he said, Father, these many years. I've been at this thing for a long time. I've been tinned in the fields for a long time. Listen, you can be a child of God. You can have gray hairs and have been saved 20 or 30 or 40 years. And that is no guarantee or an insulation against what I want to talk about tonight. You can be saved until you've been in the Lord's service for 30 or 40 years and you've got all the right answers to all the right questions and can back it up with a chapter and verse and still not be right with God. He was a son. He was involved in service. He had success to show for it. He had seniority. And notice he had separation in verse 29. Lo, these many years do I serve thee, and notice neither transgress I at any time thy commandment. This, this fellow, you talking about separation. He said, I've, I've served you these many years, and I've never stepped out of line one time, Dad. These many years do I serve thee. And listen, he was separated. My friend, I submit to you, you may be just as born again as born again can be. You can be a child of God. You can be involved in the service to God up your eyeballs. You can have success to show for that service. You can have seniority, and you can have uh, separation going for you. Like I said, wear your hair right, cut your, uh, do everything right, and don't misunderstand me for a minute. I'm all for that, but I'm simply saying you can have all of that going for you and still not be right with the Father. There's more to it than that. And then notice he also had security. His father said to him, verse 31, He said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. Listen, you can be a son. You can have service going for you, success for it, seniority, separation. You can even have security. Now as Baptists, we've got a big deal out of eternal security. And it is a big deal. And I thank God for it. But I'll tell you something. Listen, eternal security never saved anybody. You're not saved by eternal security. That's a precious doctrine, but that only works on folks who have been born again. And if we are eternally secure, and if you're born again, you are. But friend, just because you're eternally secure in, in, in Jesus Christ, and listen, if you're saved tonight, you are as good as in heaven with the door shut behind you, locked and the key thrown away. 
You couldn't go to hell if you wanted to go to hell. If you've been born again by the Spirit of God, my friend, you're saved. Ain't anything or anybody can do anything about it. But just because you're eternal, eternally secure, that don't mean you're right with the Father. Sure don't. This boy had all of these good things going for him, and they're all good. Man, all them things are good. But he had all of that going for him, but he had a problem. And his problem basically boils down to a problem that I, I have seen as I travel around the country and around, uh, around in many foreign countries that I see that are uh, destroying uh, many Christians. And there's a problem of bitterness. This fellow's got to let a root of bitterness spring up in his heart. He's gotten bitter. He's upset about some things. And listen, my friend, this fellow here is in a bad situation. And I want to talk to you tonight, if I might, about bitterness just for a little while. I want you to notice, first of all, uh, and, and bitterness is it's a very serious situation because, it really, it affects all of us to one extent or another. You're not going to serve God and not have somebody do you wrong. I don't care who you are. I don't care what kind of personality you've got. You realize there's some folks that hate my guts. Why would anybody hate somebody as loving and sweet and kind and gentle and thrifty and... All that good stuff. Why would anybody? You know, there's some, and I, I don't understand why, but listen, if you're going to serve God, I don't care what kind of personality you got. I don't care what, uh, what kind of money you got. I don't care. I don't care about any of that. If you are going to serve God and stand as our brother Hasbrook was preaching about and talking about and standing for the, the word of God, my friend, you're going to, you're going to have some folk cross your path that don't like you very much. And some are going to go out of their way to do you wrong. And I wouldn't for a moment be, try to minimize the injustices and the insults and the injuries that we receive along life's road. They are very real. You're not going to serve God long. Somebody's going to insult you. Somebody is going to take advantage of you. Somebody is going to give you an injustice. Somebody is going to injure you. That happens. Now, everything that happens in our lives will tend to make you either bitter or better. You make the choice. And if you opt for the easy one, you allow a root of bitterness to get in your heart. And like I said, oh, it's something, it, it, we can keep it covered. Until something happens, a catalyst and a situation to bring it out, and it'll bubble over in all of its ugliness, doesn't matter who's around then. But we can keep it pretty well under wraps until that root has grown and grown, and then when it begins to bubble over, my friend, it's too late then for any easy cure. You know, there's some problems that you can ignore and get by fairly without too much trouble. I mean, for example, I was up in Alaska not long ago, and uh, I forgot to take my coat. Good night. I, I used to live up there, and I know it's cold, but I forgot to take my winter coat. I took my, my little overcoat I got here. That don't work up there 40 below. And I forgot to take my hat. And therefore, I got sick. I got a head cold. Well, I come home, and uh, I, didn't, I didn't go to the doctor. It was no big deal. I just had the sniffles, had a little head cold. And, uh, you know, you can you, you just kind of doctor yourself, take some aspirin, stay out of the wind, and you're going to get better. You know you're going to get better. You're not going to die. But I'll tell you something. If you've got a cancer eating on your body, you don't take two aspirin tablets and go to bed and expect to feel better the next day or expect to get over it. You've got to get a surgeon. He's got to get a knife, and he's got to cut it out of you. You're not going to get over it. And that's the kind of problem this bitterness is. It is a cancer that will literally eat you alive and destroy you for any effectiveness for God whatsoever. And I want to talk about it just a little while tonight. I want you to notice, first of all, as we look at the bitterness here, uh, the bitterness because of the Father. Here in this particular uh, chapter here, this fellow is uh, he's in a, having a bad way. And listen, when you, uh, when you have a problem with bitterness, listen, your problem is not your circumstance. And your problem is not your contemporaries. Your problem is not what somebody did to you or what somebody said to you. Your problem is not your circumstance, nor is it your contemporaries. Your problem is with your father. That's where the problem winds up at. Oh, listen, this boy, you know what he's trying to do? He's trying to make a big issue out of rings and robes. He's attempting to make an issue out of fatted calves and fields. And that's not the issue. The issue is that the father, the father in this story, the father is happy. That's the whole issue. 
He's happy. The father's overjoyed. The father is ecstatic. The father's man, he's happy the boys come home. And listen, what right does this boy have to reign on his father's picnic? If the father's happy, then bless God, you ought to be happy. If the father's overjoyed, you ought to at least stand by the side and clap for him, amen. If you can't get in the spirit of the thing, the father's happy, the father's satisfied. He's got no right to reign on the father's picnic. But all bitterness. The reason it's so serious, because it, it ultimately gets directed right back to God. That's where it goes. Because you see, in truth, we that are Christians know this. Listen, I mean, the sun wouldn't come up in the morning if God didn't let it. And there ain't nothing coming in my life that God doesn't allow. And so what we're saying is, when we get embittered, we're saying, God, first of all, God, you don't understand my situation. Or, God, you just don't care about my situation. Well, we can dismiss both of them. We know that ain't so. And so about the only third one we're left with is, God, you are unfair. You are treating me unfairly. I am getting a raw deal out of this. And God, I don't deserve to be treated like this. this I don't see why this has happened to me. And all bitterness is going to wind up directed sooner or later right back to God. Because in essence, God has control of our lives. And, and, and when we get to that point, we're simply saying, God, I'm getting a raw deal. Turn with me very quickly to the book of Matthew. In Matthew uh, 20, I believe it's Matthew 20, this principle is borne out. In Matthew chapter 20, I think it is. Yeah, Matthew chapter 20. It says in verse 1, it says, For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is a household which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard and went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard. And notice this. And whatsoever is right. Notice he did not say whatsoever is fair. And there's a slight bit of difference, my friend, between fair and right. He said whatsoever is right, that will I give thee. And they went their way. And again, he went out about the ninth, sixth hour, ninth hour, so forth. And about the eleventh hour, one hour left to work, the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing idle and said unto them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? They said unto him, Because no man hath hired us. He said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and notice, Whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. Not whatsoever is equal, not whatsoever is fair, but whatsoever is right. So when even was come, the Lord of the vineyard saith unto his steward, Call the laborers and give them the hire, beginning from the last unto the first. And when the, they that came that were hired about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. But, now here's where most of us live, verse 10. But when the first came, they supposed, they supposed that they should have received more. And they likewise received every man a penny. And they, and when they had received it, they murmured against the good man of the house, saying, These last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden in the heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst thou not agree with me for a penny? Take that as thine, and go thy way. I will give unto the last, even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is thine eye evil, because I am good? Notice here in verse 10, it said, But they supposed, they saw these fellows that it only worked one hour. They said, well, my goodness, we've worked all day long. Man, we've been out there carried the burden in the heat of the day. These fellas just come in the last hour, and look at, they got a whole day's wages. Man, we, we're going to get us more than that. He's bound to give us time and a half. He's bound to give us double time. Man, we worked a lot longer than they did. And when they got every man the penny that they were agreed on, they murmured against the good. You know what the sense said? This ain't fair. This ain't fair. My friend, that's where most Christians in our day and time live in verse number 10. We suppose that we somehow deserve better treatment. We suppose that we somehow are somebody a little more important than somebody else, or at least raised by what we've done and our labors, we deserve a better deal. And God, you're not a, this thing you've allowed in my life, and this person has done this. God, I don't deserve that. I suppose that I deserve better. My dear brother or sister, I'll tell you what you deserve. You deserve to be in hell with your back broken, your eyes plucked out. That's what you deserve. Anything above that's pure grace and gravy, amen. You want to know what you deserve? Go off to Rome. Go down in the catacombs and walk 
through those corridors and look at the graves of the first century Christians that were hounded and hunted like dogs, that were uh, uh, crucified upside down, were lit into lamps to uh, light uh, Pharaoh, uh, Nehru's uh, orgy parties, and their children taken from their arms and thrown to the wild hogs. You want to know what you deserve? Listen, Jesus said, take up thy cross. Problem with most of us Americans, we say, how much does it weigh? We got all kind of questions. He said, take up my, my cross, thy, your cross, and follow me. And we want to say, well, 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 wait a minute, Lord. Where are we going? How far is it to this place we're going? And how long I got to carry this thing? And how much does it weigh? No, the Lord said, take up my cross and follow me. Listen, my friend, uh, if we're serving the Lord, it, listen, ain't nobody, there ain't nobody, no power on the face of God's earth or off of this earth that come in between you and your Savior. Now, I didn't say somebody couldn't make life rough for you. I didn't say somebody couldn't put you in prison. I didn't say somebody couldn't throw you on the rack and maybe uh, cause you to say a lot of things you wouldn't ordinarily say. But I'm simply telling you, my friend, you're the one. You decide. You decide what you're going to do. You decide where you'll be with God. You decide. You're the deciding factor. And the reason bitterness is so serious is because ultimately you will get finally down to the point where you blame God. Because that's where all bitterness winds up. Because of the Father. Then notice the bitterness because of the favor shown to the guilty. Up there in verse 29. And they're having a party here, but he's got a little bit angry. And said he answered, his father said, Lo, these many years, he said, Do I serve thee? And I never transgressed your commandment any time. But notice this, but you never gave me a kid that I might marry with my friends. But notice the wording here is very important. As soon as this, thy son. Well, I believe it was his brother. Wasn't it? It was his brother. He say, just as soon as my brother, no, as soon as this, thy son. He has divorced himself. He has no relationship. He said, he's your son. As soon as this, thy son was come, notice, which hath devoured thy living. So, Dad, you, you remember? You remember that big, you remember that big water money you gave that boy? You remember how you and Mama sacrificed and worked hard and built this farm up, built this business up, and you gave it to that good for nothing rascal? So, Dad, it was your money. He had taken thy living and devoured it with harlots. Now, I read the story. I didn't read nothing in there about no harlot. The story said that he went out and he wasted his living, his substance on righteous living. But you see what he's trying to do now? I'll try to be fair to him. I ain't never been around many riots that there wasn't a prostitute or around, you know, a harlot trying to make a living too. There's usually a riot, there's a harlot. Usually they run together. But that's not what the story said. And you see, he's trying to make this boy look as bad as he possibly can. He said, your boy took your money, Dad, and stuck it in some harlot's pocketbook. And, and Dad said, as soon as he was come, boy, you throw out the royal carpet. Listen, you know what? He can't understand. He can't believe. He just can't accept the fact that the father is treating this boy the way he's treating him after he's done what he's done. He can't believe that. He just can't believe it. But I'll tell you something. Oh, you know, most of us, we got we can cover it up pretty good. We know how to, you know, you know what the Bible says. It said, weep with them that mourn, rejoice with them that rejoice. But, but you ever know, have you ever noticed how that God will take somebody that you don't like and bless them real good <laughs> and give you the distinct pleasure and honor of being there when he does it? I know, I know how we do. You know, the Bible says rejoice with those who rejoice with us. Oh, oh, praise the Lord, brother. Hallelujah. Couldn't happen to a better preacher. Hallelujah. I'm so glad for you. Man, praise God. I'm glad to see you got this promotion. Woo! Man, I'm telling you, man, you deserve it, brother. Praise the Lord. But on the inside, there's this green monster. On the inside, says, is that dirty? Rotten. Now, God, how come you're doing that for that bum? You, Lord, these many years I've served thee, you have never done that for me. And you, what, you know what he was doing last week? I'll tell you what, I'll tell you myself, I saw what he's doing last week. I'll tell you, God, I don't know this, I'll rob deal here. I've served you, I've been faithful, and I've prayed, and I've read, and I've done, and God, you ain't never done that for me. What are you doing that for that guy? Don't you know what's going on down here, God? But on the outside, oh, <laughs> my brother, oh, let me smooch you right on the mouth. You're so precious. Or you take the other opposite one, 
the dear brother had a reversal. Now, I'm not talking about tragedy now. Uh, you know, any of us, I mean, we can identify, and nobody's glad about a tragedy for nobody. But I'm just talking about a little reversal. Instead of a promotion, they get a demotion. And it's that person you don't really like. Like, you know, we said, uh, uh, somebody said, that, you know, we love everybody, but there's some folk I don't like. And it just happened to be one of these dear brothers. And you happen to have the misfortune of being there to watch his little house of cards all poof, fall flat. And all on the outside, oh, oh, my brother, oh, my soul. Brother, you know Romans 8, 28, it's in the book, and I'll tell you, bless your heart, I'm just going to pray for you. I don't know why this happened to you. Oh, you poor brother, I'll tell you, I don't know why God listen, but brother, there's a reason for all this. And I'll tell you, you don't worry now. You're going to be back on time. Everything's going to work out fine. God's going to somehow turn this around. Oh, brother, I'll tell you, I'm going to pray for you. Uh, and, and Lord, I just I just hate to see that this this happen to you, but now, now brother, I, I'm on your side. And I, I don't know why, something like this, I don't know why you'd have a reversal, like, but on the inside. Man, on the inside, ah! <laughs> Whoa, pray God! Hallelujah! Da 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 He finally got his praise, God. I knew it was coming. I could see it a million miles away. I just wonder what took you so long to dump it on him, God. Hallelujah! There is justice in this life. Praise God! Now, I know you're all so spiritual, you ain't never done that. <laughs> but I have had a problem with that once or twice myself. So when you get that preacher, listen, you know what our, you know what our, our, what our attitude ought to be? I mean, our attitude ought to be, Lord God. I mean, listen, when the prodigal's been out there, man, he's blown it all. and been out with a hog. If he comes back, we're talking about a broken, as our brother was preaching earlier. Then our, our attitude ought to be, Lord God, do what you can for him. Bless him as much as you can. God, if there's anything good you can do for him, do it, God. Do whatever you can for him under the circumstances. Lord God, bless him somehow if you can. Somehow, Lord, bless him and clean him and maybe try to use him again somewhere. Because I guarantee you when the prodigal comes, he's lost it all. He's lost his inheritance. He's lost a whole lot that he'll never get back. Some of these in our day and time, as our brothers already pointed out, we've got so far away from real repentance and so forth. And I want to tell you something, friend. Now, I, I believe it's the bottom of my heart. I believe there are some things you can do in this life that there is no solution for in this life. I honestly believe that. You can do... Listen, you, you, you got so well. I don't like what this preacher says. I like Brother Greg Eastep. Who's he think he is? And go out there and throw your family in a car and get drunk and drive off down one of these country roads. You can wrap that car around a telephone pole and kill your little wife and your little babies and cut your arms off in the process. You wake up in the hospital the next day and they, you find out what you did. And from a contrite, broken heart, you cry out to God and ask God to forgive you. My friend, upon the authority of the Word of God, He'll forgive you. I know He'll forgive you. His blood will clean you from all unrighteousness. But I'll tell you something. The rest of your life, you're going out to a graveyard somewhere and putting flowers on a little grave of a mama and some little babies that ain't going to be there no more because of your foolishness. And you're going to go through the rest of your life without arms, friend. You've done something there is no solution for in this life. You're going to have to wait. If you want to see that family, you're going to wait till you get on the other side. If you're going to get two arms, you're going to wait for a glorified body. There are some things you can do in this life. And my friend, from, a, from a, some standpoint and in some situation, there is no solution for it. So I thought God would forgive us. I'm not talking about forgiveness. Yes, He'll forgive you. But my soul in heaven, especially young folk, you better remember there are consequences that go with sin. Our dear brother that stood and gave his testimony last night in the depths of degradation and sin, he carries scars on his soul. Now be that from now to Jesus comes back. There's some scars on my soul. Listen, oh, you know, and I'll tell you, you know, there's some sins that we don't mind talking about. Matter of fact, listen, they've made movies out of some of my sins. They have. They've made movies out of them. Hollywood makes profit on them. I'm not talking about me personally. I'm talking about the sin. I'm talking about the, the theme. Macho type sins. Oh, yeah, you go to Los Angeles and dig out that column there. The night I took on half the Los Angeles Police Department. I did better than Rodney King. <laughs> I put a few knots myself before it was all over. But I want you to know I looked like a golf ball inside out when they got done with me. And I got just what Mr. Rodney King deserved. I got a good beating. 
Oh, yeah, well, that's macho. Well, I'll tell you something. And everybody here tonight, if you're of any age at all, I got some sins. I want to tell you something. I hope nobody ever finds out. They ain't so macho, friend. There's some of them that are so embarrassing. If I thought for a moment that they could flash them up here on this wall, oh, my God in heaven, I believe, honest before God, if I didn't have a heart attack, I'd run out that door. You'd never see me again. Oh, we've all, oh, there's some sins that are braggadocious, but there's some of them, my friend, that you wouldn't want anybody, nobody to know. I've got some sins in my life. I pray and wonder God, my little girls never, never hear about. I trust they never find out what kind of a man that their father was. I'm not proud of them. I'm, that's not even the issue. It would scare me literally to death. You say, boy, Brother Jim, you must have a lot of, a lot of skeletons in your closet. No, thank God, they're under the blood. Oh, they're under the with a God that I could go back and erase them, but you can't do it. You can't. They're gone. The damage is done. That's why, my dear friend, if you got any sense at all, you got any sense at all, you'll take your life and use it for God, but I must hurry along the bitterness because of favor shown to the guilty. This boy, he's upset, and then lastly, lastly, when we'll go home, I want to talk about the facts of bitterness. Bitterness is something that affects us all. Because everybody receives, as I said, certain insults and injuries and injustices. Bitterness carries some, some several symptoms to it. How can you identify an embittered soul? Well, first of all, from our story here, I point out that sometimes it's surprising who is bitter. Because of the nature of this sin, it's usually, very, very, it's usually kept under cover pretty good until he gets a good hold. I mean, the father, come on, he's surprised. He, he can't believe it. I mean, this is your brother. And I mean, undoubtedly around the family altar, they've been praying for him for days and months maybe. And he's come home. This is what we've been praying for. He's surprised that the young man won't go in. I submit to you tonight, it might surprise you if you knew who in this building was harboring a root of bitterness in their heart. It might shock and surprise you. This man was surprised. And then secondly, bitterness, another s symptom of bitterness is it tends to make a person very self-centered. Embittered souls are very self-centered people. The universe just kind of begins to revolve around them. One way to, one way to know if you're, if you're dealing with an embittered soul, their, all, their main concern, their main topic, the whole universe revolves around them. And they begin to get a warped view of reality. They can't, they can't see reality anymore. It's kind of like Elijah. You know how Elijah was? He, was? he was up there on top of Mount Carmel. Had that great big old man. Had a wonderful meeting up there. Uh, uh, what was it? First Kings chapter 18. He went out there, man. Slaughtered all them prophets of Baal. Turned them into a non-profit organization. Went down to Jezebel's house in chapter 19. And he waited outside the gate. And it says he, he sat outside the gate. And Ahab went in and told Jezebel all, all that he'd done. And how that he killed all of his prophets. And Elijah's sitting right outside the gate. Waiting to see what happens. Well, uh, here comes a messenger from the palace, and he's got a little scroll. And I imagine, this is usually how bitterness starts. Things don't turn out like you thought they should or would. That's usually how it starts. And I guess he thought, I think he thought this, or he wouldn't have been sitting outside the gate. I think he thought, well, when that old girl hears what God did, how that she don't have any more prophets. I mean, these were the prophets that ate at Jezebel's table. And she got a lot of empty spots at the table, and a lot of grub, and she's probably inviting me to dinner. And I'm going to go in, sit down, have dinner with, uh, right there at the White House, and boy, it'll just be wonderful. And I think he thought that this was going to be what changed the old girl's heart. If nothing else, he maybe thought this will put the fear of God in her, and at least she'll get off our backs and quit bothering the men of God and quit bothering the people of God. But it didn't turn out like he thought. He opened up that little invitation he thought it was and looked at it. He said, about this time tomorrow, Mr. Loudmouth, Fancy Dan Preacher, you think you're something? She said, I tell you what, you let the gods do to me and more also, if I make not thy life as a life of one of them tomorrow about this time. She said, pal, you've got 24 hours to get out of town. Well, I'm going to kill you. 
Boy, it says, when he saw that, when he saw, what did he see? He saw something. I don't think it turned out like he thought it would. If, if he'd have thought it turned out like that, he'd have never sat down outside the gate. Man, he had a good head start. He could have headed out early. But he sat there to see how it would turn out. And when, it, when he saw that, he arose and went to, out for his life. And you know the rest of the story. Wound up in a cave. God came to him and said, Elijah, Elijah, what doest thou here? He said, Elijah, what are you doing in this cave? He said, oh. Lord, I'll tell you what. I've been very jealous for you, God. You know that. It's been me and you for years. And God, he said, I'm the only one. You know, he, you know he wasn't the only one. I mean, God told him he had 7,000 a little later on, but he knew he wasn't the only one before that. Well, but Dad told me, he said, listen, you, you heard how I've hid the Lord's prophets by 50 in a cave. Man, he knew he wasn't the only one. But he said, Lord, I'm the one. And he said, do you know this, Lord? You probably haven't heard about this yet. But now they seek to take my life too. Oh, God. Oh, just go ahead and kill me. Just go ahead and kill me. I, I'm no better than my father. Just go ahead and kill me. And you know, the man, he, he, he don't want to die. If he wanted to get killed, he could have stayed back home. She'd have done it for him free of charge and wouldn't charge the head God in trouble with the business. He's, he's talking foolish. Listen, and remember, he's talking to God. I don't think he's outright barefaced lying. He's talking to God. What's happened is he's got so self-centered. His bitterness has turned him in on himself, and he is looking in a distorted view of reality. Probably in his heart, that's the way he really sees it. He said, they seek my life. Who's they? Who is this they said? They did. They're going to. I ain't never met that guy. I've heard a lot about him. Oh, do you know what they say about you? Who's they? Who's this crowd? They sure say a lot. Don't do much. But they say a lot. And he said that. You know, you know what he did with that one statement? He grouped an entire nation of people. He said, Lord, now they seek my life. No, they don't. I didn't read but one little long-tongued huzzy named Jezebel saw his life. And she ain't really as interested in it as, she, as she's letting on. But she did give him 24 hours to get out of town. I think she is scared to death. I don't think she wants to come outside the gate and fool that preacher. I mean, like you, can you see Ahab's eyeballs, big as saucers? Oh, oh, mama, you should have saw it. Oh, man, you should have saw it out there. That man got up there. Man, he, he let the prophets of Baal go first. Man, they ran and raved and butt their head on the ground. That's cut themselves with knives. Said, Mama, you ain't seen such excitement with since Oral Roberts left the tin healing ministry. And, well, honey, you should have saw it. Man, there wasn't nothing happened. Said, they called on their God. They said, Mama, you know that one you always prayed to, Baal? Man, they called morning, noon, and night and said, Baal didn't even grunt. He didn't burp. He said, here comes this, this prophet. Oh, I can see his eyes getting big. Oh, he said, honey, you should have been there. Man, he got up there prayed a little old prayer about this one. He said, honey, the fire, the fire of God. Man, you should have saw it. a whop. Fell right down there. said, it didn't just take up the sacrifice. Man, it, it ate up the, the stones. It ate up the wood. It licked up the dust. It licked up the water. Mom, I'm telling you, you should have seen it. I mean, he's looking like a raven maniac. No Jezebel said, Ooh, he. So I don't want to fool that dude. I think she's afraid if I go out there, man, he has a <laughs> drop some fire down on my new permanent wave, and it'll be all she wrote. But she said, I gotta get rid of him somehow. So she said, I'm gonna bluff him. So she writes that little letter, says, All right, pal, you got 24 hours. That's it, preacher. 24 hours, and then you're gonna get yours. You're gonna get fried, pal. I'm gonna make your life like the life of one of them. But tomorrow, you better get out of town. And he takes it, hook, line, and sinker. Oh, she wants him dead. <laughs> I'll guarantee you. But she ain't about to touch him herself. But he said, Oh, he said, they seek my life. No, they don't. And you'd be surprised. In bitter souls, their eyes were like, What? What do you know? What's that, what's that about me? Who cares? Who cares? You know, really, you would probably be insulted if you knew how little most folks did think about you. <laughs> really, you probably you would be so insulted and embarrassed, you probably don't come up in their mind once in a blue moon. But if you do, have no, who cares? So what? It don't make no difference. So what? They think good, fine. Think bad, that's fine. If they don't think nothing, that's probably even better. Very self-centered people. And then, bitterness will tend to make you very cynical and suspicious. You know, the most suspicious, cynical souls on this earth are 
Christian folk who have gotten a root of bitterness springing up inside of them and taking root and it has grown and grown and before you know it they get so suspicious they get so cynical everything everything is a conspiracy you can shake their hand at the back door oh you, you, you felt the way he, you know, he didn't, didn't press my hand oh you, you saw the way he looked at me you saw that now you really have to be a preacher to appreciate this whole deal I mean the, but I mean to tell you brother the embittered souls they get so suspicious you can't say nothing to them you can't do nothing to them I mean everything's got an ulterior motive I had a dear lady one time in a church where I was I, oh man bless her heart mm. she was terribly embittered and uh, always always every little problem was a Mount Everest to this dingbat and I was in my office one day and she came I heard her car pull in the driveway. Boy, she came in, boom, boom, walking down the floor. She came up, knocked on my door, and I sit at my desk. I said, come on in. She came in. She walked right to the front of my desk, right there. Put her both hands on her hips like this. She had looked down at me. I just sat there. She said, Brother White? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, are you or are you not the pastor, the man of God in this church? I said, well, sister, last time I checked the business meeting minutes, I was. I believe I am. I am. I'm it. She said, then, pastor, she said, we, you probably don't know this, pastor, but we have got, oh, she said, we have got a terrible problem in this church. Do you know that we got a problem in this church? I said, uh-huh, I know. <laughs> I knew more than she thought I knew. <laughs> Yeah, I said, I know. She said, I'll ask you. She said, that she went on about this problem. And she, I mean, she ranted and she raved. And she raved and she ranted. I just gave set to the wind and the sails and let her go. I let her rant and I let her rave until she drove herself on the rocks. And she ran out of rant and she ran out of rave. I mean, she blew herself plumb out. Sometimes that's the best thing to do. I sat there working on my Sunday school outline for Sunday and let her rant and rave. She finally worked herself up in a good tizzy. Even spit on my concordance before she got done. She got all done. She said, oh, she said, well, she said, Pastor, I want to know one thing. Hey, you as the pastor of the man of God in this church, I want to know what are you going to do about this problem? So I drew myself up to my full height in my chair. And I said, dear sister, you have been kind enough to point out a problem. And listen, I, knew, I knew, didn't know about the, I knew more about the problem than she knew about the problem. And I said, sister, you rest assured. I said, this is Tuesday. You come back tomorrow night. Wednesday night, we're going to meet this problem head on. I said, I'm glad you've let me in on this. Now I said, as a man of God in this church, it is my God-given duty and responsibility to take charge and to handle this problem. And I said, sister, you rest your chair. I said, we're going to take the book. We're going to take the Bible. No grace. No mercy. Letter of the law. We're going to lay the Bible right in the middle of this problem. We're going to drop the plumb line of God's word. Chapter and verse. Line upon line. Precept upon precept. No mercy. No grace. Just the book. She said, praise God. I knew you could handle it, Pastor. So you go home, rest assured tonight, sister. Brother White's on the job. I'll take care of it. So she left. She didn't get in her car. I heard her come back in. She walked back around, knocked on the door. I said, come on in. She didn't come in, but she kind of stuck her head around the door. She said, Pastor, uh, I know you're going to take care of this problem. I said, yes, boy, you rest assured. I'm going to take care of it. The book, the book, that's what we're going to do. So, a preacher, you didn't tell me what part of the book we're going to use. What part of the book, what part of the Bible uh, does this problem involve? I said, sister, undoubtedly. Without a doubt. I said, Wednesday night, we're going to take First Thessalonians and chapter 4 and verse number 11. I said, that is the verse, and we're going to shove it right down their throats. I mean, chapter verse, they're going to swallow every word of verse 11. Well, she said, praise God. I'm glad we got a man of God that knows the Bible, can lay a Bible right out of power. I said, amen. I can do it. Turn around and walk out. Well, she didn't come Wednesday night. I think she went home and had a Bible study. I think she might have read First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 11, which says, if I'm not mistaken, something like this, that we are going to study to be quiet and to do our own business. And brother, that's the one we parked on Wednesday night for a long, long time. 
And I'd be honest with you, you'd be surprised how many problems in a local church would not exist if we just do that. Amen. Just shut your mouth. Mind your own business. Life would be a whole lot more pleasant for everybody. <laughs> You're always telling bitter souls, always, always trying to stir up something. I think some just like to make life miserable for the preacher. But I assure you, it's miserable enough with some of that crowd around without even opening their mouth. Just looking at someone makes you want to puke. I think that's the truth. You'd be surprised what your face says. Well, let's see. i got to go on here. Oh, yeah. This next one is very important. Symptoms of bitterness. It'll tend to make you self-centered. Very surprising who is bitter. Make you very cynical and suspicious. And then bitterness will tend to shut you out of some very important events in the Father's house. Look up there. They're having a party. But he's angry and he would not go in. Listen, the Father has thrown a party. And I don't know about you, but I found my Heavenly Father throws the best parties in the universe. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm going to the party. Amen? I love parties. Man, I'm a party animal. Praise God. Brother White is here. Let the party begin. Hallelujah. I mean, I'm going to the party. You say, well, no, preacher, they ain't never killed a fatted calf for me. They ain't never killed one for me neither. <laughs> but guess who's going to get a piece of the fatted calf? Yeah. Yeah. Uma numeruno. Right here, pal. And listen, I don't care if they never kill one for me. Matter of fact, for the reason they killed it, I hope they never have to kill one for me. But if they've killed one for somebody else, praise God, I'm going to get a piece of it because I'm invited to the party, amen. And listen, if you get there early enough, you might get a piece of the tenderloin. You can't ever tell. But bitterness, it'll tend to shut you out of some very important, very wonderful things going on in the Father's house. Now, you can go out in the garden if you want to and... Drag your lower lip with a mullet mully grubs. Oh, nobody loves me. Everybody hates me. I'm going to go to the garden and eat worms. <laughs> Greasy by me, go for guts, chew them up, spit them out. Nobody loves me at all. Well, you, if you want to do that, help yourself. Go ahead, help yourself. I don't know about you, I don't like greasy grimy go for guts, I don't like words, but I sure love the fatty calf. If you want to, go ahead and sit out there in the parking lot, pal. That means there's more for me. And I ain't above eating your piece if you don't show up. Matter of fact, if I can get it, I might get half of it while you're standing there talking to somebody else. But God's got a party going on. Have some important things going on at the party. We're talking about some important stuff. We're making some important plans at the party. And I don't want to get left out on nothing. And you allow yourself to get a bit and say, Preacher, you don't know what she said about me. You don't know what he did to me. I don't care what he said. I don't care what she did. It's not worth missing the party for. It's not worth it. I didn't say that what happened wasn't real. I didn't say that. I'm saying it's not worth missing out on the party. And then also, tend to shut you out of important events in the Father's house, and it'll tend to spread to others. And look at there in chapter 12 of Hebrews. I think it's chapter 12, verse 15. Somebody quoted it the other night. In chapter 12 of the book of Hebrews, in verse number 15, it says uh, something about like this. It said, Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you. Now, if that's all there was to bitterness, that'd be enough. But it doesn't stop there. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you. And notice, and thereby. What thereby? That root of bitterness that sprung up in you. Not your wife. Not your children. Not your pastor. You. And because of you, it is going to affect some other people, thereby many Many be defiled. Oh, I can get mad. I can get upset at my pastor. And I just say, well, let's go on, put up with this, and walk out the door. There's a precious lady by the name of Judith White, whom I've known very intimately for over 26 years, walking out behind me. There's a little 14-year-old girl walking out behind her. There's another 23-year-old girl that's married that I hope to have character enough to stay, but it's going to affect him. Got another daughter, 25 years old, lives in another state. It's going to affect her. I've got friends all over this area. It's going to affect them. Thereby many, many be defiled. It's not just a subject, my friend, of you. It's you. It's your family. It's your children. It's your church. It's your pastor. It's your life. Yes, sir. It'll spread to other people. Yes, sir. And then bitterness is never a right response to a wrong situation. Never. 
Never. It's never, never right to get bitter. That is never a proper response. Never, under any circumstance. The Bible says, be angry, sin not. And most of us Baptists, we got that first part down. But if we can get angry, it's a drop of a hat. Don't take, you don't take me much to get angry. Just let me wake up in the morning and I'll be able to find my favorite preaching shirt. I can get angry real quick. Just let, you know, just let something, let me, let me have a flat on the way to church. I get mad enough. I mean, if I had the power, I'd just take my car, squish it up like that, throw it off in the ditch and walk to church. I can get angry. Would to God I could get that other half of that thing. He said, be angry and sin not. Now, sometimes anger is a proper response. The problem with most of us, we get angry over the wrong things. And we don't even get angry over the right things. Be angry and sin not. The anger is sometimes a proper response. Sometimes a proper response might be, in more times than we want to admit, silence. Sometimes that's the best response. There's no response. Not all the time, but sometimes. There's a lot of ways you might be able to handle it, but bitterness is never a way to react. Never. And, and listen, my friend, the problem with bitterness is usually, especially, especially if you love God. And most of these, I believe you love God tonight. Most of you folks here are probably saved. And listen, it's very, because we know all the answers and we know all the, the, the things in the Bible, and boy, we know how to take care. Usually when bitterness first springs up, it's very unnoticeable. We have a way of dealing with it, opening, whipping up this little carpet, spiritual carpet, sweep it under there, drop it down, say, oh, bless God, they don't bother me. I don't care what they say. Just instead of dealing with it, and sweeping under the carpet, it's got a way of germinating, growing. Yeah. Had a lady one time, she still don't like me, I don't think, but it's down in Texas. I'll tell you what, the best thing ever came out of Texas is Interstate 10 eastbound, as far as I'm concerned. I just don't care much for Texas, but I was down there one time. And I went to preach for this guy, and it was a Wednesday night, and he'd been asking me to come for two years, and I finally got a cancellation. I went by for a Wednesday night. I had a long way to go, and, I, and God really impressed me to leave and go on down the road, but I was so tired. And wore out now. And he, he pressed on me to come home with me. He said, Preacher, I want you to come home with me. And God was telling me, he said, Son, you, you get on down the road. And I thought, Lord, I'm, I'm so tired. And man, I, this brother, I don't want to insult him. Or, so anyway, I, I, you know how you do it. I prayed, you know, I prayed until I got the leadership of God on it. You know what I did? I prayed God right out. That's what I did. And I convinced myself the logical thing to do is go home with this man. So I did. Well, walking out the door, I stuck up my hand to shake hands with his wife, and she didn't shake hands with me. Which, you know, I just, no big deal. I thought, well, maybe the woman's blind. She didn't see my hand. So we went on out. I got in the car and went to the house. And so they, he took me to my room. My room was right next to their bedroom. And I was and I was sitting on the edge of the bed taking my boots off. And I heard their door. And I go, wham! I mean, you could have heard it. I thought, wow. She's probably deep, too. She can't hear good. It's all, well, maybe a gust of wind caught her or something. Boy, it, she, and she started. She said, I want to know. And I said, honestly, before God, she's talking almost that loud. She said, I want to know one thing. She called this preacher by name. She said, I want to know one thing. Where in the world? Did you dig up that loudmouth, ugly, fat preacher you brought in our church tonight? I said, oh. Man, I got a few feelings. Man. I mean, any one of the three was good enough to stop that. Ugly. Fat. Mm. Loudmouth. Oh, man. Man, she was ranting. She said, I don't know what's wrong with you. She called my name again. She said, you're dragging up Tom Thicken here too. And it's not, oh, it's not bad enough. I got I to gotta sit there for over an hour and listen to that idiot rant and rave. She said, you realize he spit right on my hair? You realize every time he slung his hand, sweat was coming off his head, slung right across my dress. She said, no, it's not bad enough. I got to sit there and listen to him and get spit on and sweated on. Oh, no, you got to ask that idiot home with you. She said, I'll never understand. No, oh, she was ranting and raving. I was sitting there. It's hard to feel comfortable under those situations. <laughs> and I thought, I think that I, obviously this lady don't like me very much. So I think I'll just, you know, I think I'll just go. I'll think sneak out, get in my car, let it roll down the back, drive, you know, and go on out of here and be gone. So, oh man, I can't do that. I'm tired. She'll shut up in a minute, maybe. And I'll, she'll think about it in the morning. She'll probably be embarrassed the way she was anyway. And I said, I'm tired. So I laid down and went to sleep. When I went to sleep, I went to sleep with the melodious notes of her ranting and raving bouncing off the walls when I went to sleep. I don't know what time she quit, but I woke up early in the morning. I was doing my devotions, getting ready, and I said, Now, God, Lord, I said, Now, you know i got to go out there and face that woman. And I said, I'm telling you, Lord, you know. I, I, and I, I don't ever say nothing to no preacher's wife. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hang high as Pike's Peak for a lot of things at Judgment Day, but ragging on some poor preacher's wife ain't one of them. I ain't never. I'm, I'm not going to do that. I don't care how bad she is. I ain't going to get into that. But I said, Lord, you know, I ain't never ragged on a preacher's wife in my life. But I said, Lord, 
I don't want to embarrass that woman, but she ain't fixing me no breakfast. If I have to embarrass her, I said, as bad as she hates me, she's have to grind up some glass and put it in my scrambled eggs. I said, uh, she ain't fixing me no breakfast, and I'm not going to let her. Well, I didn't have to worry about all that, Pastor. She had no intention on fixing me no breakfast. No, 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 no. I came out there, and I walked in, and there she sat in all of her glory. That's way back, way back, a long time, over 20 years ago. And she had on a raggedy old looking house coat. And this is back when them ladies used to put these orange juice cans in their head, you know. And she looked like one of these Martian things. And I thought, Lord God, I guess if I looked that ugly in the morning, I'd, you'd have a right to be can takers, I guess. Oh, she a man, she's a halfway pretty lady the night before. Something that happened during the night. And she sat there, this old raggedy house coat on, this old rollers things in her head. And I walked up, and, and she said, she looked at me, and she said, do you want some coffee? I said, well, yeah, that, that wouldn't be bad. i got to go in there. She said, well, it's right over there. I said, make it yourself. I said, oh, oh, man. So I think I just want a glass of water. So well, the water's in the faucet there. So I got me a glass of water. And, and you know, to make a long story short, I left. And I was driving down the road. And the more I thought about that, the more I got. I hadn't got 20 miles down the road. I was almost mad enough to cuss. I didn't. But I, I, I was almost mad enough. And I was driving down the road. And I said, who does that old bat think she is? I mean, I happen to be a man of God. A man of the cloth here. I said, God, there ain't no way for, there ain't no way for her to, what, God's got to strike her dead. That's what I'm doing. And I said, well, ah, uh, she don't bother me none. Let's go, uh, you know, a fundamental independent, Bible thumping, Bible believing Baptist preacher. Man, takes more than that to get me upset. I take half that baby aspirin to help me get over that. And, I, and what I did, folks, I picked up a little spiritual rug and I swept some things under and plopped it down with my cloak of spirituality and my machoism. Something that should have been dealt with. I should have dealt with it myself. I'm not talking about her. And I, I just got rid of it. Well, you know how things are. I, for, I totally forgot about it. Six months later. I was in Arkansas. Big fellowship. Uh, big fellowship meeting. I was on deputation. As a missionary, I'm going to the fellowship meeting. I walked in the door. Who should be there? Right in the middle aisle. Halfway down the middle aisle. Standing in the middle aisle. Who should I see but good old Sister Battle Axe in all of her glory, minus the orange juice cans. And as soon, honestly, I hadn't thought about her for five or six months. And as soon as I saw that woman, all of a sudden a big green monster began to come growing up out of my innards. And I saw her, my eyes narrowed down to little pinpoints. I thought, there she is. <laughs> Praise God. I said, oh, God, Lord God, you got, I said, I don't know who's moderating this thing, but God, you got to speak to him. Tell him to preach me today. I'm, on, I'm the man for the job, God. I said, put me on. I said, I'll see old sister battle axe. Glory to God. Oh, she thinks I'm ugly. Ha, 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 ha. Where will I get done with that old bat? She thinks I'm fat. Oh, she thinks I sweat. She thinks I do some sweat. Oh, ha, ha, ha. I'm, I spit right on top of her head. Oh, God, turn me loose. Turn me loose. Fortunately, the moderator was a little more spiritual than I was that day. And God did not lead him to call on me. But I got a good seat where I can see Sister Badlax. I look over there at her. Give it all evil eye. Well, you know how them things go. We're broke. We're going to have food. I got down there early. I waited to see where old Sister Badlax sat. And I ran. I got it. Right down in front of her. Sat right there. Now, my mother taught me better than this. And I'm ashamed of it now, but I've done it. I ain't never done it again. We was eating rice, some kind of gravy stuff, and I was sitting there, all right in front of this old girl, you know. I was sitting there, and I was going, just throwing it, getting about that far from my mouth, and throwing it in. And I wasn't being a very good shot. And I was, I was in the mouth open, and rice is piling up in the corners of my mouth and oozing out, dripping off my chin back in the plate, and I rake it off my chin. Well, and I said, sister, sister, would you please pass me the pepper? And I spit rice, little rice globules all over there. Oh, that poor lady. It's amazing. It's an amazing thing in God's head. Her husband didn't slap the fire out of me. I'm not told oh, me. It was awful. Oh. Well, I finished up. I didn't get no meetings out of that deal. I walked out of that church feeling right proud of myself. I walked out with my head held high. I said, well, God, 
We sure put one in the place today, didn't we? <laughs> Anytime you need the man, I'm the man for the job, God. I can handle it. I don't have them old battle axe long tongue hussy. Just, just turn over to me, God. I can handle it. There's another one I'll chalk up. Bit of dust. Put it on my account, God. I want the credit for that one. I walked out and got in my car. Well, I, someone hadn't noticed till I got in the car. But the birds quit singing my soul. Well, no birds singing in my soul. Lord wasn't talking to me like he was before. Now, I don't know about you, that's kind of lonely. I said, Lord, we sure done it, didn't we? Lord ain't saying nothing. I'm not nothing wrong. And then the enormity and the error and the wickedness of my heart overwhelmed me. And I, there's been fewer times in my life that I have been more embarrassed and humiliated. So, Brother White, you really do that? Folk, I didn't tell you half of how I acted that day. I didn't tell you that half. And I pulled my car off. The big cornfield. I could take you there today. If the, I don't know if cornfield's still there, but I pulled my car off. And I said, Lord God, I said, I'm sorry. I got out of my car and I went in that cornfield. And I said, God, I said, I'm not coming out of this cornfield until I can get some kind of victory. Until I can pray for that dear woman and God not feel uh, animosity in my heart and feel like strangling her. I said, God, I don't have the victory. And I said, God, I, I need it and I've done wrong. And I went in that.